I don't want to share someone else's thoughts. I want to create my own original thoughts. I want to create my own original solutions. I want to look at situations and come up with my own phrasing, my own words, and do it my way. This is the John Taffer Podcast. Shut it down. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm John Taffer. Thank you for listening to the John Taffer Podcast. Happy Hanukkah, which ended a couple of days ago. Merry Christmas, which is only a few days away. And of course, <laughs> Happy New Year. And boy, are we welcoming 2021. Man, this was the worst year, I think, of all of our lives, Corey. It's, you know, of all the things that I've lived through and businesses that have succeeded and are failed and, and f- family problems and health crises and family and such over the year, losing loved ones and all of that, I can't imagine a worse year in my life than this year. But, you know, it's incredible. We talked about this last week. There's still a lot that we can be thankful for. Certainly the fact that the vaccine is coming. There's a third one going to be approved in a couple weeks. It's pretty darn exciting. But I wanted to look back at this year because last year, one of the most popular podcasts we had, Corey, was the end of the year podcast when we did some lookbacks. Yeah, it was. You know, and used some great clips and stuff. So we thought we'd do it again for you this year. Uh, And we really pulled some great stuff together. But, you know, I think about the highs and lows for me this year. You know, we opened Taffer's Tavern in the middle of a pandemic. It's a franchise. Our franchisee is a great guy, Hammond, and, and, and we couldn't take his franchise money and then not have him open. <laughs> yeah, that would suck. So, you know, our job was to help him get this unit opened and, and, and make it successful, and our corporate team has been there for over three months uh, dealing with COVID to make sure everything is safe and opening it. But son of a gun, we got it open. And Corey, I don't know if you knew this, last night was a record night again, uh, sales, record sales. Wow. So so uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, the huge success that we've had with Taffer's Tavern in Alpharetta, Georgia. We actually opened officially on October 29th. That was a big deal for me uh, as a brand. And we have uh, territories coming in Boston and D.C. The D.C. location was signed actually today. Uh, the landlord, the deal was signed. So we're going to start building that pretty quickly. Hopefully you'll see that by summer. And then I want to think about the other things that happened this year. We introduced our spicy Bloody Mary mix in May, which was a huge success. We increased distribution of our seltzers this year to 17 states, which I'm pretty darn excited about that. And we conceived, put together a complete frozen food line, which nobody knows about yet, Corey. I'm going to say it for the first time. We've been working with a company creating a frozen food line under the moniker of Taffer's Tavern Frozen Foods, Great Tavern Foods. Right. So we've been working in the test kitchens. We got all the products developed. We got all the packaging designed. And now we're talking to the retailers and... We're going to introduce that next year, but we put it all together this year, and it was amazing, uh, the process that we went through. And then I think about the new flavors that we added to seltzer and, and, uh, you know, how well Bar Rescue has done. That most of the shows on my network, many of the shows in a whole Viacom stable, the Disney stable, and all the large media companies were canceled this year. And, you know, I look at shows that have been around for a long, long time that got canceled. We didn't get canceled, Corey. And we are scheduled to start production in February. Well, and COVID uh, uh, <laughs> allowing, uh, we will. So you know, I'm really thankful that Bar Rescue will be back for season eight. It's very, very exciting. It's a different kind of season because these are bars that have been affected by COVID. So it's not like the owner is a dirtbag who caused his own failure. That's right. not the case here. These, in many cases, are, are great operators and great stories and great businesses that have been in business for years and years that were screwed by COVID or government shutdowns. Well, congrats, John. That's awesome. Yeah, so, so I'm very excited. So Bar Rescue's back. And when I think of all of the moments, many of them we've had together, the amazing guests that we've had on the show, the things that I've learned this year, Corey, going back to March 13th when production shut down, we ran back here, moved our studio to my house. Oh, yeah, I remember that, yeah. I remember all the predictions that we made. When we said restaurants will be at 50% capacity, people said I was an idiot. When I said uh, uh, kitchen staff are going to wear face masks, people said I was an idiot. When I talked about supermarkets making aisles wider and and, and one-way traffic and all that kind of, everybody said we were idiots, Corey, but almost every single one of our predictions panned. Right. And then when we told everybody there'll be two vaccines, one will be frozen at 70 below zero, the other won't be. We oh, talked yeah. about that remember, back yeah. in September. Mm-hmm. And our information was right on. 
And here it is. We said it would be here before the end of the year, and son of a gun it was. And we predicted both of them, and, and uh, uh, there wasn't any great marvel of prediction. Unlike a lot of other people in the media, we did our homework. We didn't tell you there couldn't be a vaccine or there had to be a vaccine or there would be. No, we pulled out information that was very meaningful and shared it with you. And other things we forecasted as we went through the year. And, and you know, I guess I know my business, Corey, because we did pretty good. So when I think about all the things that we have to be grateful, probably the thing I'm greatest most for, and I got to say it exactly this way. What? The end of this fucking year. <laughs> I'm right there, John. I'm right there. <laughs> so we had some great interviews this year, and I wanted to bring a couple of great moments with some great interviews. So I want to take a look back at 2020. You guys, I think, will really enjoy this. And I want to talk about each of these interviews for a moment or two as we go into them and pull them out. But we had Dr. Phil on the show, who is a very, very dear friend of mine and partners with Phil's son, uh, uh, Jay and and uh, the McGraw family and I are, are, are good friends and having Dr. Phil on the show is very meaningful to me. Dr. Phil is quite a guy and he had an awful lot to say about mental health during the pandemic and Corey, this was months and months ago. It was. It was right at the beginning, yeah. And, and the things that Phil said, in fact, came to fruition. Yep. The depression issues and all of the things that he talked about came to fruition. So, you know, it's a tough couple of months before we get out of this. It's going to get much, much worse. So I think re-listening to some of these moments and advice that Phil gave was really interesting. So let's give a listen to Dr. Phil. Loneliness in and of itself is a very stressful situation. And there have been a number of studies that have been done about the effects of loneliness. And uh, when when people are lonely and by lonely, I'm talking about a lack of encouragement from family or friends, being by yourself, uh, where you're in an apartment, you're four walls, you just don't have the normal human contact that you're used to. <clears throat> there was a study done in 2016 at Newcastle University, and they found by following people across time, that there was a 30% increase in the risk of stroke and coronary heart disease among people that were lonely. I mean, right. think about that, a 30% increase in the risk of stroke and coronary heart disease. It shows how a, social we are as a species exactly. and how important that is. We are social animals. Uh, Florida State University College of Medicine did a study, 40% increase in a person's risk of dementia that was published in the Journal of Gerontology. For people that are at risk, they're in that age bracket, a 40% increase in risk of dementia. Uh, functional limitations go down. And what happens, John, and I don't want to get too technical here, but leukocytes of lonely participants, and leukocytes are the white blood cells that play a real key role in the immune system. Uh, these go down because our body thinks when we're alone, we don't need an immune system to fight off viruses or any type of attacks. So our immune system goes quiet. And so we're much more susceptible to contracting some type of virus like the coronavirus. So just being lonely, feeling lonely makes us more susceptible to that which we are actually locked away from right now. So I'm so, blessed. You and I are blessed. We have <clears throat> you have Rob and I have Nicole with me. What about that person alone in a 30th floor in an apartment in New York? So they really are challenged by this. Well, they are challenged by it. And then let's add to that. Let's add to that the fear of catching this coronavirus and contracting COVID-19. So you've got that pressure. Now you've lost your job. There's economic collapse all around you. You have the unknown. Are you going to get through this okay? Is the world going to be the same? So you have all of that stress and pressure. So now that's when the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. And when that happens, we've now got studies that show us that once you're in that state of adrenergic arousal, where you stay that aroused all the time, people are 32% more likely to die. And, and let me tell you what will change that. Even looking at the picture of a loved one can make people in pain 
feel that pain less intensely. Pro-social behavior like volunteering, helping a neighbor curbs all the physical symptoms of stress. So if we, we are social animals, so if we start reaching out to others and giving away that which we need the most, it starts to heal us from the inside out. So there are things we can do. So when people say things like, I'm calling five friends a day, you know, I'm FaceTiming with my grandchildren every day. These are exactly the kind of exercises that in essence would, would solve mm. this. Exactly. If you feel lonely and you, th you think, well, I, I wish I had somebody to talk to, then be somebody for your neighbor to talk to. You know, you can go down to the corner, knock on the door of maybe an elderly person lives on the corner, knock on the door and step back to maintain social yep. distancing and say, you don't know me, but I live a few doors down and I just know that you live here alone. And I just wanted to come say hi and see if you need anything. I'm going to the store. Can I pick something up for you? I'm a stranger. So you probably don't want to give me your phone number, but here's mine. If you would like to call and talk, I, I would love to visit. I don't know if you have FaceTime, but here's my FaceTime. If you would like to talk, I would love to listen. Just visit. Can And maybe you're out mowing your yard and you look down there and there's this little long, roll your mower down there and mow their yard. I mean, just little things like that can make a huge difference in the way you feel and the way they feel. That's really powerful, Phil. And, and, and it's, it's a great inspiration for somebody just to go down the street or call that neighbor down the street and interact in that way. I'm going to do that tomorrow myself. I have somebody in mind that I can do that with. Well, you know, it's, it's, this process has been nothing but an education for me, Corey, when I think about all of the people we, and how I've learned from every guest that we've had and how much I learned from Dr. Phil. Well, when we come back, I'm going to be with Kristen Chenoweth, who's one of my favorite actresses, and we're going to be talking about Broadway. Be right back. So Kristen Chenoweth is, is a great actress, musician, dancer. I mean, she does everything. Multi-talented, beautiful, unbelievable person. And Broadway got shut down. And Kristen didn't stop paying her employees. She tried to keep things together. She tried to make it last as long as she could. And, you know, we've all talked about how the restaurant industry has been impacted by this. And, and we've been devastated. We've talked about how the movie theaters and gyms and children's play facilities and all of these businesses have been devastated. But nobody's talking about the entertainment business being devastated. And I, I wonder if that's because, Corey, the faces of the entertainment industry are millionaires. Right. They're all actors. And, oh, they'll you know, be fine. Yeah. And tell, yeah, absolutely. But what people don't understand is there's 57 people. Actually, I'm wrong. When you do pre-production, post-production, and my road crew, there's 100-plus people on the crew of Bar Rescue. Sure. 57 we travel with. You know, these are people that are your age, Corey. You know, this is their job. This is their lives. They right. go from show to show. It's a freelance world, right? You get a gig for 10 weeks. You go to the next gig for 10. These people aren't working. I mean, their industry was completely shut down. And I find it shocking, candidly, that more celebrities who have big platforms, haven't come out, and I'll just throw any name out there, a guy like George Clooney, why the hell hasn't he come out and said, let's help the entertainment industry, not the millionaires, not the on-camera people, but the ones behind. Right, that make them. The yes, yeah. the PAs, you know, all of the production teams, the gaffers, the, the tech guy, I mean, all of these people have lost their income. Yeah. Well, Kristen was the voice of that industry. And having her on the show meant so much to me because I picture the faces of all of these people that are out of work. They work on my show, many of them. So having Kristen on board was a lot, and spending time with her was very, very powerful. Give a listen to Kristen Chenoweth. And, and what a lot of people don't realize is employees that work for productions like, like we have are freelancers. They don't have long-term jobs with long-term benefits and long-term. They go from gig to gig. So they'll work on one production. They'll get a five-week deal to work on a TV show with you. Then they could lose their work for three to four weeks, and then they got to schedule another 10-week gig, and then they go here and they go there. So they don't have that stability often that people with full-time jobs have. And, you know, as I sit here with you and, and picture of, you know, of us in front of the lights and all of them back there, my heart breaks for what's going on right now. Oh, same. I'm, I'm heartbroken and... You know, the thing is, is that when you and I aren't working, they're sure not working. That's right. right. 
And Broadway, as you know, especially being a New Yorker, New York runs, I mean, this might sound a little arrogant, I don't mean for it to, but New York is Broadway. Broadway is New York. No um, question. And, and the restaurant business is right there with us. So the, the thing that you and I both love are, are the things that are so at risk. And like, for example, I have 11 people that go out on the road with me when I tour. And as these months go by, because I was in the middle of a tour for my, for my latest record um, doing that, and those guys that come out on the road with me take a night off from Broadway to come out with me. Now they've got nothing. So I think each of us, and I'm, I'm sure that you're doing your, yours in your way and, and what works for you, but you know, I had to sit down and think about how I wanted to how I wanted this to work for me. One of the things that I do is I live beneath my means. I always have. I'm not crying poor, John. I'm just saying I live beneath my means in LA and New York so that for these times right here, also so that I can do passion projects. Um, it's also for times like this. Um, I'm being able to pay my, my people half of what they would normally make until we reschedule. And the, the, the hard part about it, about all of this is, is that I'm sure you're, you're figuring out ways to make it work in your business, but we don't know what, when we're going to re-entry and we don't know how, what that's going to look like. So even if live performance comes back, let's say Broadway or touring comes back, let's say in September, which could be generous of me, are people going to want to come to are they going to want to come to see the show? Are people going to want to gather in restaurants? I don't know. And it scares me. And so all I can do is pray and keep saving my money, um, keep talking with people like you, doing things for the Actors Fund. I do a lot for the Actors Fund now um, because those are the crew. Those are the people. It's not just about actors. It's the crew. And it's the people that you were talking about, ushers that have no job. And, um, you know, our president keeps saying we're going to come back stronger. And I do believe that I, I am going to be a pot. I'm going, I'm going to choose to be a positive person on this bill. Um, and I'm not going to get political at all. I'm just going to say, I do know that America is a great country. We will come back stronger. I would love to see people, you know, not everybody can do this, but if you bought a Broadway ticket and, and, and it's July and Broadway's not back yet. If you could maybe think of it as a donation. Not everybody can do that. I know that. Lots of families. Great are, suggestion. You if, if you love Broadway and you bought the ticket, then you're more inclined to give that donation. It'd be so. great. It'd be great if some people could. But, you know, with our business and, and food is right next door to our theaters, you know, oh, rest. Yeah. And that's where we go after the show. So I'm. I don't know what it's going to look like, John, but I'm praying every day um, to God for our country and and that and um, that we will and for our medical care and we will and that's another reason I'm going back to your show for a second. I really appreciate the emphasis that you put on people forgetting not for for losing their passion and forgetting what's important, and then it shows in their work and it shows in their cleanliness and it shows in the way they again make make their their way and um that's when you know you're burnt out which you've talked about on shows and which i can sometimes go kristen you're going to go on burnout if you don't slow down a little bit or they're just plum they can't handle it and they need they need somebody to understand and when you come in and you understand which is why it's so lovely for me to talk to you because you understand uh, well, thank yeah. you. so now of course when i spoke with, with kristen we thought that broadway would open the first of the year. Then it pushed back to May. Now there's discussion that Broadway won't come back till 22, New Year's 22. Oh, really? So it's been devastated. And, you know, 60% of the patrons who go to see shows on Broadway are tourists into New York. So until okay. tourism comes back and all the pieces, you know, have to fall back into place for these industries to come back. And I cross my fingers. Broadway is very special. You know, I'm lucky I got to go see Broadway growing up in New York many, many times, and, and it, it, it's one of the things that makes New York City special. And the American musical and Broadway is a very American thing in very many ways. So let's hope it continues to go on. You know, the next interview I did 
it was it's funny to call Mark Cuban a TV star because to me Mark Cuban is one of the world's greatest salesmen right he's a really smart business guy runs a great sporting team right. and, and you know to me Mark Cuban when he came on Bar Rescue for Operation Puerto Rico 2 years ago I got to spend a good amount of time with Mark and I realized what a sincere and caring guy he was and talking with Mark on how basketball is going to adapt and how he's finding success in the sports world as a rookie because he wasn't a sports owner before he came into this business. Yeah. So how is he adapting? And now, you know, we visited Dr. Phil about our mental health. We went and talked with Kristen Chenoweth about Broadway and live theater and how that's being impacted. Now I want to talk to Mark Cuban about the future of basketball and how basketball and sports is going to adapt to this new world. Here's Mark. So we've lost all these industries. What do you see? And I know you've been asked this question a lot, but what do you see for basketball now? Do you see us opening at 50% capacity? No, I think we start with no fans. I think we start with no fans because TV is a big part of our our business, right? Well, it's a big, important part of our finances. And so, you know, people are dying for sports right now. You know, if we can do it safely and get everybody back on the court, the ratings are going to be huge. The advertisers don't have any place else to put their money. So they'll be more than happy to spend money with us. And so there's a lot of opportunity, but, you know, you know, safety first. But I think, you know, as every day goes by, we become a little bit smarter about the virus. And I think we're, we're going to be able to figure it out. I think so, too. It's starting to feel like we almost got it figured out. Yeah. Vegas opens tomorrow. I know. And I when know. you think about the logistics of a card game being safe now, so, so you know, and a slot machine being safe now. So yeah. now when the slot machine pays you off and you get the chit, it shuts down. And, and it can't be it. used again until it's cleaned and the operator resets it. So all these little procedures. Do you think that there'll be a digital element to the uh, fanless games? Will there be an audience uh, 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 sound? Will oh, yeah, we'll do all kinds of fun stuff. The arena? Yeah, we've got all kinds of We're just working on it today, actually, where um, we'll be able to have fans press buttons and talk into you know, their phone and have that all come out together and have the cheering and everything. You know, and the other team will be competing on their end, and we'll see who does it better. And so, yeah, we're we're definitely going to um, gamify it and have some fun with it. So the the loss for the fans in the arena could be the fan the gain for the fans who are watching it. Yeah, no, no question. We'll we'll have some fun with it. You know, and and that's one of the challenges that we have in, in general. You know, as things become more digital, and 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 it, you you know, you're in the TV business, right? As as streaming becomes such a bigger component, particularly for younger um, viewers, you know, we have to adapt. We have to come up with new ways because, you know, it's not that TV's dead. There's still, you know, 90 million homes with televisions that watch TV, but, you know, there's just a big, big um, challenge to retain that audience and the momentum's obviously going towards streaming. And we've got to find ways to do a better job of reaching younger audiences with, with our streams. You know, it's interesting. Uh, some friends of mine in the NHL, I'm a big hockey fan. And, and I know you tried to buy the Penguins once yeah, yeah. at some point. But uh, in NHL, it looks like they might be the first league back, possibly. And it's Yeah, I know they're trying to or, you know, do the 2014 thing. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, you know they, they've got different considerations because we can set up a basketball court anywhere. They've got to really focus on how right. they set up ice and getting their guys yeah. ready. Do you think that the uh, a reinvented basketball season will be at, at common locations or you think it'll still be at, at home courts around the country? No, I think it's going to be um, the Hotel California setup where you check into one location and you don't leave until you're eliminated from the playoffs. Right, right. And then everybody's kept in quarantine and such. Yep. Again, my favorite thing about Mark is when he says he's always selling. He's always selling. He's always selling. It's the truth. Mm-hmm, yeah. I guess I'm sort of selling right now, right? You're sort of selling right now. Right, yeah, we're trying to sell this episode. Absolutely. <laughs> so he's absolutely right. So Jake Steinfeld, most of you know him as Body by Jake. Every note, every letter, every text, every email, every conversation, anything Jake Steinfeld does, he ends with the same two words, always. And those words are, don't quit. That's right, yeah. And he's all about the discipline and not quitting and mental health and success. And what people don't know is Jake has put together a program and bought the lacrosse league and put together a program that he's putting gyms in schools across the country for free. So this is a guy who puts his money where his mouth is. And we talked about mental health with Phil. We talked about the live entertainment industry with Kristen. We talked about basketball sports, how that's adapting with Mark Cuban. I want to talk about our bodies now and how do we deal with being so stationary and 
dealing with the impacts of pandemic on our bodies. And I got a chance to do that with the man himself, Body by Jake. So let's listen to me and Jake Steinfeld. But when you're stuck home in this pandemic, it's hard to find things to accomplish every day. We're stuck. So sure, I could call family and friends and FaceTime with my grandson. and do. But at the end of the day, what the hell did I accomplish? I'm stuck home. So work is giving me things to accomplish. You know, you've really got me thinking. I need to have a physical accomplishment every day when I'm home. Not just yes. a mental accomplishment, not just a working accomplishment. And you've got me really thinking here. So I'm stuck home, and we all are right now. Everybody listening is. Now, we want to do things. We want to call people. We want to stay active. Why wouldn't each of us allocate a certain amount of time every day, just like Jake does, and say, okay, I need to accomplish something physically every day while I'm home in this pandemic. I must accomplish something physically and I can accomplish my mental, my work, you know, my personal things as well. But if I don't accomplish something physically today that I'm not accomplishing my day. So you you know, you've got you me thinking this way, yeah. Jake. It's really, you've got me changing my mind. So when I'm finished with this podcast, I'm going to hell upstairs. And I'm going to get on my equipment. And, and every day I'm saying to myself, I have to accomplish something physically today. And, I love it. And, and for and, these 60 days, say, Jake, I haven't been doing that. To me, accomplishment this, has been work and interviews, and, but none of it has been physical. And that's a major mistake. You have to take care of you first. Think about all the people that you have. And, and this is for everyone. You close your eyes for a second. How many people do you take care of? How many people need you? to be healthy. How many people need you to be focused? And you're the guy doing all this great stuff, but if you're not healthy and you're not strong, it all starts from you looking in that mirror. And I'm not going to tell you this, John, about it's great. I want you to go upstairs and I want you to hit some iron. I want you to get on the recumbent bike or the treadmill or what, whatever you have at the house. Don't make yourself nuts. We don't want to make exercise a second job. No. That's a, everybody has their own things going on right now, and especially, and, and, and we should bring it back as you just did. We're living in, this is a crazy moment. It, it's going to pass. It will definitely pass. But this moment, I, you know, I'm, I, I've asked my kids to, to sort of write down notes of, of how they're feeling and what the, so we can look back at this at some point in time and really remember what it was like and what did you do? during the 2020 pandemic, just do one exercise. Because I want you to get excited about tomorrow trying two exercises, mm. as opposed to doing this for the first time today, and you're gonna wake up in the morning going, oh, gee, Jake, I'm sore as hell, I can't, I'm- Then there is, is no tomorrow. Exercise. Right. I'm with you. Look forward to something the day after and the day after, because you get up in the morning, and I, I promise you, try this. It's the greatest way to think about just your day. Compartmentalize things, where instead of looking at things so overwhelming, and look, a lot of people, John Witt, with two blessed guys, right? There's a lot of people challenge, a lot of challenges going on. Anxiety, stress, financial, financial family, all kinds of things. I want to make sure that you're strong. That's the goal. If you're strong, you can handle things. You can handle things one challenge at a time and take a challenge with an exercise. Do the exercise, beat the challenge, baby. So Billy Vasiliadis runs R&R &R Partners here in Las Vegas. We've all heard the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That was created by R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. R&R &R does all of the national, I should say, global marketing for Las Vegas. And uh, the R and R agency, which also has offices in other cities, I think is one of the greatest branding and marketing agencies in the world. And Billy runs it. So we've talked so much about how the COVID and the pandemic has impacted our mental health and live entertainment and sports and our physical health. Well, how does it impact brands? How does it impact travel? How does it impact our future? That's what I got to talk with Billy about. And it was an incredibly powerful conversation. Give a listen. What kind of shifts do you make to market in today's world? I, honestly, I think a big piece of it is being out in, in front of them regularly. 
Um, it's not kind of the big spikes in cycles of, of typical media. And you, you know, so you buy big, typically you buy big in January. That's when people are making their travel plans. Mm. It gets, you know, it becomes a, a pretty good first quarter. Then you can kind of project that you did pretty well in the first quarter, et cetera. Um, so there were times to spend and times to hold back. Now there needs to be more of a consistency and a present. Mm-hmm. Someone's at home. Uh, a Vegas ad pops up that says uh, escape this weekend. Uh, yes, you can. There are, oppor- you know, there's an opportunity to, to have those celebrations you need to have. You can have them in Vegas. And along with that, then obviously we continue to run our Vegas smart message, the masking and, and the social yep. distancing because people find that important. Sure. Um, and so it's more. You know, it's interesting, Billy. I hate to interrupt you, but I, w- I want to pick this no, apart. Please. What's interesting is the language change that you just made because every word you said tied back to spontaneous. Your entire messaging changed. And, and, you know, that's what listeners need to understand. You can't use an old message in a new time. So you're you're, you're causing me to say, you know, what am I doing tomorrow? Maybe I will go tomorrow. But that little shift in language is the genius in what you're doing because you're causing the consumer to make a different type of decision. Well, and listen, you know, I appreciate all the kind words and, and the compliments. Um, I don't know that I, I'm not a genius, but I'm a good listener and I listen to our customers and Vegas has been a leader by following, uh, by knowing where our customers are, where their mindset's at and what they need. And the one thing that's interesting too, John, that's consistent, even in this, in this spontaneity, even in this COVID era, Vegas continues to be the greatest escape place on earth. It's the one place where people go, where they can feel as if they can, get out of some terrible situation and whether it's a, a, a job pressure or, uh, you know, in this case, obviously a disconnect, COVID. A disconnect from I got to get out. I, yeah. and, and in Vegas, I don't need to have an itinerary. I don't need to know that you know, I don't have to make reservations for every hour of my day in order to enjoy Vegas. In fact, I'm going to enjoy it more if I don't. Right. And if I, if I want to bring my golf clubs, I will. And if I don't want to use them, I won't. And no one's going to judge me for that. I come here and I'm not judged for escaping, for releasing, for disconnecting, for unplugging. And so the great thing about Vegas is that there's subtle changes in our language. Maybe there's subtle changes in our media mix. Maybe there's subtle changes in our, the platforms we use, but the essence of Vegas being that place where I could go be who I want to be, who I aspire to be, uh, is still the purest, the purest, purest, purest part of our brand. The idea of adult freedom is still the purest part of our brand. And we saw that with that first third you talked about. Yeah. The idea, they felt free. They felt the ability to come here. I mean, you think about it. They were in Southern California, which locked down pretty early. Yep. Uh, met most of them, mm-hmm. <laughs> the initial group. Uh, they were in their homes ordering Grubhub or whatever they were using to have their food come home. Maybe they did some uh, drive-by pickup. Um, but, man, they were in that house. For months, they couldn't wait to get out. They had an opportunity to come here, and even though there wasn't Lady Gaga and David Copperfield and Cirque shows, etc., but I had a beautiful hotel room. I had a great view. I got served. I had a great meal. Five, six restaurants, not one. Right. Right. I could go hang by the pool and get some sun. I could go walk around. I could be in the open. I can gamble. And that idea of that escape, that that release that they got from the from from the freedom that Vegas offers is, has been, is, and always will be the differentiator here. And why I know that when things begin to open up more, when we get our midweek business back, I, I have no doubt how fast the Vegas recovery will be because it's always been remarkable. If you yeah. look at post 9-11, and I don't want to compare this to 9-11, it's it's not comparable in so 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 many ways. But in one way that it is, two ways that it is. One is the, the fear, right? Mm-hmm. And secondly, the air travel. I mean, you know, we had both, right? Everything was shut down. Air, airports were shut down. And then the fear of travel. Vegas came back the fastest, the fastest of any. Our airport was the first international airport to open. We came back the fastest. Why? Because people felt they could come here. And we saw this in our surveys two weeks after 9 11, people saying, God forgive me. I, I I know I shouldn't be thinking this way, but I just can't keep seeing the plane hit those poor people in the tower. 
I mean, I, 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 I just need a couple of days break. And Vegas is a place I feel I can go get that done. I can go do that. And you know, what's interesting, and, uh, Billy, is, is yeah. how you, you, uh, you sell the emotion. You do. And, and you know, uh, uh, for, for listeners to realize, you, you don't necessarily sell the product. You sell the way the product makes you feel. And you sell the emotion. You sell the personal connection. You sell the relevancy. I'm relevant if I come to Vegas. I am someone if I come to Vegas. I have options. Right. I can go. I can do. I can. All of these things add to our identity and our relevancy. And, and that's what's wonderful about Vegas because it, it's not a place, it's a thing. It's a feeling. <laughs> it is. Yes, it's a feeling. It's a feeling. It's a, and any restaurateur or hotel operator or bar or nightclub operator, if you can identify with the feeling of your businesses, why people come, is it jubilation, is it dancing, is it energy, is it a culinary sure. experience, is it relaxation, is, is it romantic? If you understand where the hook is and you build your languaging and your marketing around that, that's sure. when we connect. Uh, Billy Vasiliadis, unbelievable marketing mind. So we think about it, if we keep ourselves mentally healthy, physically healthy, focus on these aspects of our business and our brand and connecting with our guests and our, and our audiences, that's how we come out of this. And at the end of the day, it all comes back to the relationships we have, Corey, with each other, with our customers, with our partners, uh, 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 and all of that. It all comes back to relationships now, even more than ever before. Right. And, and, you know, I think everybody's going to do business with people they know these days before they start doing business with strangers. You know, during the pandemic, probably the most accelerated business other than PPE, masks, and things like that has been technology. I mean, technology has stepped up to do remote learning. Technology is stepping up to do remote business meetings and conventions. I mean, look at us. Look at this studio. This entire studio, is, yes. So everything now is being enhanced by technology, and it's getting to the point when we put Taffer's Tavern in and we're engineering all the safety aspects of it, it almost, when you say the word safety, Corey, the next word is technology. Yeah. Because anything that adds safety today is almost technology-based. So the future of business meetings, uh, uh, get-togethers, conventions, education, all of these things now have become so technology-based. And digital currency is now coming into play, which is some scary, scary stuff. So what is COVID's impact on technology? And what does digital currency mean to us? Well, these are two very, very big things that we need to be aware of. So I reached out to one of the leading experts in the world, Mark Peschke, who's been on this podcast about a year ago or so. And it's great to have Mark back once a year that we can get a little technology update from him. But I asked Mark to fill us in on, on the scariness of digital currency and uh, all of the technology changes that are going to happen. Sort of a little glimpse into the future, if you will. So it's always an honor to have him with me. And when I had Mark on, it was, I think, 4.30 in the morning in Australia because Mark was in Sydney. So oh, yeah, that was right. He woke up, had a cup of coffee, and jumped right on this interview for me. So give a listen to my buddy, Mark Pesky. You can't blame the technology companies for this because they did the best they could to give you the best quality disembodied experience. And it turns out one of the big reasons we go to events is to have the embodied experience. So, and so there's going to be a real tension, but we do know... And this is one of the things that we learned. So Microsoft moved its build conference online. The build conference normally gets about three or 4,000 people when they have it in the real world in Seattle. This year they had 60,000. Online. All right, online. And so there's this idea that for a certain kind of conference, online is now easier and better and works better at scale because they're trying to educate a massive number of technology developers or a Salesforce conference, trying to educate a massive number of Salesforce people. So those things, probably they've moved online for good. All right. You know, now it, I will. It's interesting yeah. uh, uh, because I do V notes, I call them now. So I'll do keynote speeches and I'll do educational programs at online conventions or brand meetings and things like that. And we've done a bunch of those this year. And, and I'll set up a, a room in my house with a curtain behind me and I'll simulate a convention stage when I do it. And, and I'll do it just like I would a real speech. I'm walking back and forth and I'm doing my thing. And then afterwards, we'll open up questions and answers. And you're right. I feel that that connective tissue just doesn't get to the level that it would ever be interacting with the live room do you see technology ever solving that that essence of i guess the human dynamic 
Okay, so the answer is both no and yes. Let me let me give you the no first, all okay. right? Because the no is because so much of that is about being embodied, is actually being physically present. And technology doesn't solve that problem. It kicks the can on that problem. On in the further horizon, there is another solution which comes into the category of augmented reality. I've just written a book about augmented reality and I didn't really cover this in the book. But with augmented reality, you should be able to put on your magic spectacles that you'll get from Apple or Facebook in a couple of years. And everyone who's in the conference with you should look basically as if they're there fully in 3D. And you'll be able to make eye contact with them. So you'll have that feeling of presence. Now, we don't have all of the technology for that, but seriously, by the end of this decade, we'll have that technology. Technology will be cheap. It'll be everywhere, similar to the way we're using webcams today, right? Will that give you 100% of the experience of being present in person? No. Will it be an 80-20 thing? Probably. Oh, wow. I got to tell you, the digital currency thing does scare me. But it's pretty cool to think that I could send my car to get charged. It pays for itself. So in theory, if I, can I send my autonomous car to McDonald's? Will it go through the drive-thru? Will it order my food for me digitally right through the app? Yeah. Will it then pay for it? It will be charged to the car's wallet. <laughs> right. right. Then a car would then bring me the food. I mean, in theory, all of that is technically feasible. Yeah. So, so you can do it with the <laughs> app to pre-order it. Just drive up to the window, take your food, prepay and all of that. So... It's pretty amazing when you start to put all of this together, Corey, of, of, of uh, uh, what digital currency and everything you own having its own wallet and, and debits coming out and credits going in. And, and you know, I think they're going to do so much of this that we'll all be so freaking confused that none of us will be able to keep track of our own money anymore. I guess yeah. we just have to trust that somebody else is doing it for us. I don't know. But, you know, I got a little emotional in last week's podcast. And it got a little heavy. And I got a bunch of comments from people. You know, gee, John, it was very personal what you talked about in, in last week's podcast. It was. And it was from my heart. And I meant the things that I said very, very much. But, you know, I did a, a, a podcast just a few weeks ago where we asked you guys to call in and talk about divisiveness and the end of divisiveness and post-election and with the Biden administration coming in. And is this a chance for divisiveness to end? And, you know, when Joe Biden talks about, you know, he's going to work with the other side and he's going to break down divisiveness and cross it. Man, I hope all this is true. But how do we feel about it? And I asked all of you guys to call in and talk to me about divisiveness. Do you have more stress in your family, more stress in your business, more stress in this? How has this impacted? And do you have an attitude of divisiveness now or not? And the answers are actually pretty powerful. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more meaningful to me than talking to you guys, the listeners. And that's what these calls are all about, you guys, and how you felt about divisiveness. We have to be better. We have to do better. We need to act better. This, yeah. this, this lashing out at one another and, you know, you're wrong because you don't agree with me. And, well, that's my opinion. And you don't agree with me, so I don't want to hear what you have to say. That has to stop. We need to find some common ground. It, it's it's too much. And the fact that the election was so strong on both sides, you know, Trump got more votes than he did last time, 67 million. And Joe Biden winning by about 3 million votes or so, which is substantial, don't get me wrong, I'm not denying that. But he still only polled in 50.5% of America. So my point is that both sides are half of America. So to diminish yep. the other side and to suggest that they're meaningless or trivial and or insignificant just isn't smart when we look at this election. So there's a great reason for us to come together because it isn't a small minority that feels one way or another. It's half the country that feels one way or the other. Let's assume for a moment, Chris, that that did happen. And let's assume for a moment Trump wins the White House and the election is clean. Is that an opportunity to end divisiveness? Again, it, it's an opportunity, but just with what I've seen year to date, not even really year to date, but let's call it since St. Patrick's Day, um, the other side, I mean, they're just not going to open up to that. They they not only don't want four more years of Trump, you know, they're just demanding that their side go ahead and win. I mean, so to answer your question, it's an opportunity, but I, I just don't see how that's ever going to happen. Do you think this is the time for political divisiveness to end? Do you see an opportunity now, Sherry, for this political divisiveness to end once this election is over? Or do you sense that it's going to continue? Unfortunately, 
I think it's going to continue because there's so many people on either side that just hate either side. And and you think? I that, mean, I see it. Go ahead, please finish. I, I I I see it every day on my Facebook between friends, and it it's so disheartening to see the way friends on any other year would talk to each other. And then right now with this going on, they're just so rude and hateful and basically unfriending themselves yeah. with each other just because of political parties. Now, what do you think, Corey? More divisiveness, less divisiveness? Honestly, it sounded pretty split. Yeah, I think know? so, too. I think so, too. Well, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's interesting. When you, when you do a podcast like this, Corey, and, and you realize, looking back like this, this was a pretty intelligent year. I mean, we had very intelligent people on talking about very intelligent things. There was not a lot of fluff in no. this year's <laughs> podcast. Not at all. Last year's podcast, pre-COVID, it was a lot more fun. We had Puff the Magic Dragon and, you know. Right, was, Nate it, Schmidt. And, it, it, right. Nate Schmidt and, and, and Dennis Miller mm-hmm. and comedians. And, and, and so it, it's what a difference a year makes. Oh. But we're all here. Those of us who are listening are all here. And, uh, you know, as I wind this podcast down, we'll have another Best Of podcast for you next week. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll be back the following week after that. But, you know, let's do take a moment and think about divisiveness and think about where it gets us. I think about how much we need each other right now. It's Christmas. One of the best times of year as far as reaching out to each other. It's a time of giving. It's a time of hospitality. It's certainly not the time for divisiveness. So I wish you all a merry, merry Christmas. I wish you a great, happy new year. And I'll talk to you soon. Do you want to see more of this podcast? Then hit subscribe right now. No excuses.